the Attorney General. Mr. Vice President, I thank you most sincerely for the opportunity to jump into this debate, Mr. Vice President, so much to say and so little time, so I will jump immediately into responding to a statement made by the Honorable Senator. Uh, Senator Lachmidial, she made a call on the government to take action on something we have failed to do in the last seven and a half years. But I asked the Senator and I asked the Honorable Senator who brought this motion from 2011 to 2015 when this bill was passed, what did the then People's Partnership government do to proclaim the legislation? My answer to that is nothing, Mr. Vice President. The Honorable Senator spoke about, you know, reading the Hansard. Well, I did too in preparation for this debate, read most uh, um, I, I diligently, the Hansard report of the 2011 bill that was brought in two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate, before it was passed. And I want to remind the public, I want to remind the people of Trinidad and Tobago and the Honorable Senator who spoke about this government lack of proclamation. I want to make reference, Mr. Vice President, to Hansard dated May the 23rd, 2011, pages 748 and 749 of the said Hansard. The then minister who piloted that bill, Mr. Colin Paratab, Honorable Colin Paratab, this is what he said in the this is what he said in the winding up of the bill in the Senate. He said, to date, Mr. President, the office of the Prime Minister has already developed a draft organizational structure to fully operationalize the functions of the Office of the Information Commissioner. I think that would allay some of the fears of those on the other side. It is the intention of this coalition government that the fall that following the passage of the bill that's the passage of the bill in 2011 the proper procedures would be followed such as consultation with the public management consulting division of the ministry of public administration to bring to the cabinet before the end of the calendar year 2011 uh, um, a finalized organizational structure for its approval what was done at the end of 2011 nothing and that is on the hand side by this government. The, the Senator, 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 first and foremost, there's absolutely no reason to raise your voices while a senator is making a contribution. That's one. Senator Lida, I did not ask for a response. Minister, a senator would like to ask if you would give way. The Vice President, I have no difficulty with giving way to the Honorable Senator, but I just have to conclude respectfully the point that I was making. The point that I was making is to put on the record and to remind the people of Trinidad and Tobago who's are paying attention to this debate. You see, in 2011, you see the opposition comes here and they speak as if there's they to have holier than them. And they speak about all their great intentions. In 2011, the Hansard reflects, and I brought the Hansard because the, the Senator spoke about the Hansard, and I read this Hansard and I have it here. There was certain assertions, there were certain promises made by that coalition government that what would have been done by the end of 2011, and all I remind the people of Trinidad and Tobago is by the end of 2011, 20, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, nothing was done. Because you see, they was focused on Section 34 then now, and all the other things that followed that government. So they didn't have time to proclaim this legislation, but comes here to speak about this current government and what we have not done to proclaim so far. So Mr. Vice President, I know the Senator has a question for me. Before I jump into responding to some other statements made by Senator Lachmidial, of course, I will give way to the independent Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Madam Minister, what aspects of this bill is unusable? And what is the timeline to fix these issues? Um, relative to the unusable parts uh, of the legislation, when I get into looking at the GDPR model and look at some of the consultations that are currently engaging, Senator, I would certainly attempt to address. Uh, that's when I get into the crux of uh, my contribution. Um, I would certainly attempt uh, to address uh, those pertinent concerns that you have raised. Uh, but if you would respectfully just allow me to address, uh, before I jump into the crux of my debate, some of the points that were made by the opposition. 
You know, as I continue along with Senator Lachmidi Allen, this is something that the opposition always speaks about taxpayers, dollars, taxpayer dollars. Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, most respectfully, I am a taxpayer. I pay real taxes when the month come. And therefore, it is my re I see it as my personal responsibility as well as a taxpayer and citizen to ensure that what policies and provisions that the government implements, that it is in the interest of all citizens, including myself and my pocket, me too, being a taxpayer. So you see this taxpayer nonsense that they constantly come. It's not, it's not all your money. It's tax. I am a taxpayer, Mr. Vice President. That being said, um, uh, these and to be quite honest, that was uh, that was really all I saw that was necessary to respond to in in, in Senator Lachmidial's uh, um, contribution. I will move immediately to the move of the motion, Senator Wade Mark. Again, I said so little time and so much to say. You know, Senator Wade Mark came to the Senate today and he said a healthy society is dependent on a trust on trustworthy information. He reminded us in this Senate, this motion addresses a critical issue that fundamentally impacts on the privacy, dignity, and democracy of our nation. I wrote it down as he said it. My answer to the Honorable Senator is two words, Cambridge Analytica. That is all. In response to privacy, dignity, democracy, and our nation, the hip hypocrisy of the opposition to come and speak here about pri I agree you know I agree the protection of data it is about privacy it is about dignity it is about democracy of a nation but this is the same people who are responsible for Cambridge Al uh, um, Analytica that's that's my only response to, to that statement made by um Senator Marker and of course, I have hundreds of articles here for the public who, who can't remember, could call the name, the time, the date of the article, understand it, have a Netflix series and all on, on, on Cambridge Analytica. Senator Mark, Mr. Vice President, he mentioned Section 4 was not proclaimed. And I know Senator Vera, in his response, uh, addressed that. I myself have to address it and say how very much disappointed I am in Senator Mark. He is the person who brought this motion today and perhaps what the senator should have done in his preparation for this motion where he believed he was here to bust Mark and bust this government truth. I respectfully address the senator or to, uh, ask the senator to turn to legal notice number two of 2012, part one, section one to six. And what that legal notice says, Mr. Vice President, is that indeed section four that Senator Mark has placed erroneously on the record and said that it was not proclaimed. That has been proclaimed. As a matter of fact, it was proclaimed under the then People's Partnership Government. Government. And in that particular, um, in that particular proclamation, Mr. Vice President, what we have is the general privacy principles. Um, of course, Section 1 to 6 haven't been proclaimed. So I just had to correct the record uh, relative to when Senator Mark came here and indicated that Section 4 had not yet been proclaimed. Um, Senator Mark, Mr. Vice President, he also, in, in his contribution, I want to say the Senator would have dropped the ball again in preparation for this uh, uh, for this motion. His motion, which again, I would have thought he would have done a little more research or instruct his speech writers a little differently. Mr. Vice President, the Honorable Senator said, um, section, well, first to begin with, why I say the Senator has dropped the ball is that Section 25 of the Valuation Act, of course, it was an amendment in 2029 brought by the PNM administration. But I asked the senator, your party was sitting in opposition at that time. And if when that said amendment was brought and the opposition was dissatisfied, nothing at all prevented the opposition from bringing forward or to, from, from bringing forward any such amendments to the law in, in its existence at that point in time, Mr. Vice President. Um, so that being said, Mr. Vice President, um, I want to believe... Uh, Oh, Senator Mark as well. Senator Mark also made the point that Article 8 of the European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights allows for the protection of personal data. He went on to say, yet still this government fails to protect the personal information of its citizens. He said that the government now has personal information of citizens, such as telephone contacts, and of course he went on and on and on. 
Mr. Vice President, in response to that statement made by Senator Mark, in the substance of my presentation, I will look at the GDPR outlines um, that, uh, of course, uh, regulates data protection in Great Britain, a 2018 piece structure. And, of course, I would show um, in the crux of my presentation how such data is to be shared and disclosed, hence the reason why, Mr. Vice President, in the Caribbean and more so in Trinidad and Tobago, most territories are reviewing their respective pieces of legislation to ensure that same is in alignment with this GDPR model. And I'm pleased to say that in Trinidad and Tobago, this is one of the reasons, as I get into the crux of my presentation, explaining to this Honorable Senate why we cannot support in its totality Senator Mark's uh, um, motion. And more so, Mr. Bacchus would have mentioned at the part where he calls upon the government to immediately proclaim. The reason why we cannot immediately support Support. It's because we too as a nation have to take into consideration the provisions of the GDPR, what it outlines, and bring, of course, our legislation as close as possible to those international obligations, which of course, um, which of course uh, I will get into, which of course I will get into in the crux of my presentation. Mr. Vice President, uh, um, of course, uh, I want to say, as, as I turn to a more sober presentation, which is the presentation made by independent Senator Vieira, the senator said that the key takeaway is when data gets into the wrong hands, bad things happen. And I have to say to the honorable senator, we on the government bench, we do agree with you. I do wholeheartedly agree with you with the misuse and the mismanagement of that data. And, you know, I listened to Senator Bacchus's presentation, um, a very stellar contribution, if I must say so myself, uh, a very sober presentation made. And three takeaways from the senator's presentation, which I would also like to springboard off of in responding to why the government is not in a position to immediately proclaim. Three of my takeaway, the, the takeaways is that the senator, of course, spoke about the relevance. He spoke about the impact of the legislation and he spoke about the implementation bits of the legislation. And those three areas are critical, Mr. Mr. President, in us being in a position to be able to fully proclaim this piece of legislation. Now, and, and in explaining and in looking at relevance, impact, and implementation, Mr. Vice President, of course, what I would look at is, uh, again, looking at some of the reasons why we are asking for your patience and we are asking for the time to give us the time which is required for us to continue to revisit the legislation so that, of course, we can ensure that the legislation, once fully proclaimed, is relevant, it has the necessary impact that the legislation legislation intends to create, that, the, that that was the intention behind the legislation, and more so, looking at the implementation, part of, part of the, looking at that era, implementation, we also have to ensure that all arms of state, private and public entities are ready to receive and re the rollout of this particular piece of legislation. Now, Mr. Vice President, if I may respectfully take this Senate very briefly through the history of the Data Protection Bill. Now, to put into some historical context on the proclamation of the Data Protection Act, Mr. Vice President, under the former administration, it is correct, and many of my colleagues would have alluded to it, Part 1 and Part 2 of the Data Protection Act 2021, these parts were proclaimed. And yes, they dealt with primarily, um, they dealt with preliminary issues. So, for example, part one, sections one to six, are dealt with the general privacy principles. And then we have part two, um, parts of sec certain sections of part two was proclaimed. Those sections were sections seven to 18, 22, 23, 25, 26, and 28, which primarily, Mr. Vice President, dealt with the powers and functions of the information commissioner. Now, under our current administration, Ms. Our, our gov under our government, Part 3, uh, which was Section 42A and B, concerning the disclosure uh, by public bodies um, for the purpose of the collected, for collected or use consistent with that purpose, that particular part, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, um, uh, was indeed passed. Now, I've heard a lot of information placed on the public record uh, relative to this 
Chinese government's intention uh, behind the passage of Part 3, Section 42 A and B. And Mr. Vice President, just for the benefit of, uh, of course, the listening public and, of course, the sober members that sit in this uh, particular, in, in this honorable Senate, I want to remind, I want to discuss the public interest point. Public interest, when, when this government took the decision, Mr. Vice President, to proclaim Part 3, Sections 42 A and B, the public interest point became yeah, yeah. so critical because sometimes as legislators, as government, we are called upon in the interest of that public in which we serve to bring forward legislation that will bring that that will bring forward legislation, Mr. Vice President, that will serve uh, a greater good. Now, in at at the time we would have section 42A and section 42B, the what would have happened at that time, the unproclaimed part, Mr. Vice President, was resulting in an id in, in, in sorry, an administrative blockade to implementing other pieces of legislation and hence the reason so what we had is a part of the law we had an exist we had an existing section 42 a and b and with section 42 a and b not being proclaimed we found that there were administrative blockades that other pieces of legislation were of course uh, um uh, were, were of course stopped from being enforced by and as a consequence of that mr vice president a policy decision was taken uh, in order for us uh, uh, to be able to deal with that administrative blockade why do i bring up the point of public interest when laws are passed laws are passed at all time especially by responsible governments such as ours with the interests of the public at heart. Now, if I may respectfully remind the Senate of that whole concept, that legal concept of the public interest. Now, this is a criminal case, Mr. Vice President, I'm going to refer to, but the principle of the case, the racial dissident in the case, as it relates to the public interest is what I want to read into the record. The Canadian court, Mr. Vice President, in a case called R versus Morales, defined public interest as one that involves many considerations into area, not the least of which the public image of the criminal code and ultimately the protection of what overwhelming percentage of citizens of Canada who are not only socially conscious but law-abiding. And, and the case goes on to say, therefore, there is no explanation of public interest but the principle derived from a Nambian case where one of the grounds for refusing bail was that it would not be in the public's interest can be applied. In that case, a policeman was charged for stealing a police-issued firearm and shooting. Now, the case went on to say the Nambian Criminal Procedure Act, Section 63-4E, states that a person may not be released on bail, where in exceptional circumstances, there's a likelihood that a release of that accused will disturb the public order and undermine the public's peace or security. Mr. Vice President, and that is the piece of dicta that I want to pull from the case because that deals with a public interest point. Whenever decisions, and I want the Senate and I want the listening public to understand, contrary to the conspiracy theorists, cons contrary to the fear mongering that is put forward by the opposition as it relates to why this section 42 A and B was proclaimed. I want the public to understand that oftentimes as responsible legislators, as responsible government, we are required to proclaim certain pieces of legislation or we are required to review law in the interest of the public. And in this case, when, sec when part three, section 42 A and B was proclaimed, that public interest was paramount in the minds of the government when we dealt and we focused on this proclamation. So it was not about wanting people personal information. It was not simply about pushing a political agenda. It was about uh, freeing up and allowing, giving, giving teeth to legislation, which had it not been proclaimed, served as a considerable administrative blockade in the way of other pieces of legislation. 
And hence the reason, Mr. Vice President, I wanted to respectfully remind the public um, of that whole public interest point and the modus operandi of this government when we pass pieces of legislation, always bearing in mind, how is this legislation going to, of course, one, uh, contribute uh, to affecting and, and improving the lives of our citizens? And two, we always take into consideration the interoperability of law position. The interoperability of law position is simply that which speaks to there may be one piece of legislation that could based on the, current, the form or substance that may stand in the way of another piece of legislation being able to be operationalized and when that comes about we as a responsible government we have to do what we have to do and that is uh, uh, primarily as it relates to one of the reasons that uh, or mindset behind that proclamation of section 42a and 42b that was done in the data protection act under this government. Now, Mr. President, uh, for the benefit, uh, of course, uh, of uh, our senators, uh, learned senators, and uh, the members of the listening public, um, the remaining provisions to be proclaimed are notably part three, the protection of the personal data by public bodies, part four, the protection of personal data by uh, by part uh, um, private sector, uh, part five the con um, the contravention and enforcement, and part six the miscellaneous provisions, which of course yes is most of uh, most of the bill that remains, uh, um, which requires proclamation. Now, Mr. Vice President, I know Honourable Senator C. Pasad, um had asked. Uh, Honorable Senator had asked a question relative to um, the parts of the bills, the parts of the legislation which are now unenforceable. Um, what I can say to the Honorable Senator, and, and this is not simply the government looking for excuses. The reality of the day is that from 2011 to now, circumstances has changed. The reality of the day from 2011 to now, we have international obligations in the form of the GDPR and uh, what we have had to do now is to ensure and to bring our just as Barbados did Senator Lachmidial spoke about Barbados passing their legislation uh, Jamaica as well would have had to do that but what these nations did in proclaiming their data protection legislation what was paramount to their mind was the GDPR model so what we are currently doing what is currently before the Law Reform Commission, what is currently before the drafters, what is currently before the legislators, is this fundamental piece of law, this GDPR model, and seeing how close as possible we can bring it uh, to, to, to the provisions provided. What I will not want to do, and what I'm not in a position respectfully to do, is to itemize to you, unfortunately, clause by clause, currently that uh, is not uh, um, operational at this point or that has become obsolete but I can get but I can re but, but, but what I can say to you is that that is foremost in our minds in the review of the legislation so for example there we, we are embarking upon a process where the entire legis and, and remember and if I re may respectfully remind the senator while the office of the attorney general and the ministry of legal affairs is responsible for the law part of it we must work in tandem with the the Ministry of Digital Transformation. We must work in tandem with the Ministry of Public Administration because it's a whole of government approach. And sometimes that is what requires the time because what is critical is for us to be able to continue that dialogue, continue that consultation. And, and as I'm on the point of consultation, as I'm on the point of consultation, Honorable Senator, and of course for the benefit of all of the senators here, do you know in 2011 when this bill was passed, and the Hansard is there to, to reflect, so I'm not making up I'm not making up this. In 2011, a senator who sits in this Senate, Honorable Paula Gopi Schoon, raised the point on the Hansard about the lack of consultation in 2011 when this bill was passed. And that Honorable Senator, in her contribution, asked the then government, why is it that this bill was being passed and yet there was a lack of consultation that took place? Of course, the bill went on, it was passed. When the PNM government took strain and took hold of the legislation um, in 2015, we would have, of course, notably recognized gaps in the passage of that law. And what we were, what we were then required to do is what 
I call some sort of damage control. And one of the areas is in the area of consultation. Now, I'm bringing that up because, Honorable Senator C. Pasad, um, while I'm not in a position, because of time in particular, to go through ball by ball every single section of the law that has now become obsolete, what I can say to you is that at the Office of the Attorney General, we are working with critical stakeholders, which are other critical ministries, who also have the technical expertise. We are also working with our Law Reform Commission and those who have been dedicated to the task of reviewing the legislation um, in ensuring that once we are able to create a product, that product is in alignment with, of course, proper consultation or after proper consultation has been completed and more so that it's in alignment with our GDPR uh, uh, model. So that was just to quickly um, to quickly address uh, a part, uh, well, well, to somewhat address uh, the concern that the Honorable Senator uh, would have had. You know, Mr. Vice President, I recall in preparation for this particular, uh, in, in preparation for this debate as well, and, I, and you would find me constantly going back to the 2011 Hansada. And the reason why I'm doing that is because while there was a great debate, in the, uh, there, there was a considerable amount of debate on this bill in 2011, there are members of our government who raised critical issues in that 2011 debate as it relates to proclamation and none of those concerns in 2011 was answered and therefore it, that I, I want the public to understand that from 2011 and this is not just about political gallantry this is not just peaconging politically here this is as a, this is a serious business and state of affairs of our country in 2011 when our government sat in opposition I have pages of Hansard where Senator, who did then, uh, he was then an opposition senator, Al Rawi, on three critical, three instances, asked the then government about this same, his concerns, raising concerns that he had concerning the proclamation of that bill. For example, if I may pull Senate Hansard, Monday, May 23rd, 2011, where the then opposition Senator Faris al Rawi at page um, 684 said, so when this bill comes in and is born as an act, if we are serious about implementing this act, we are going to run into extreme difficulties on the content control and implementation control, the policing control and the reporting control. And this is in fact one of the main difficulties in considering this bill because the issue of implementation is critical. And I will tell you why I'm making reference to that concern raised by Senator Al Rawi. Because when Senator Al Rawi became the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago, priority in his mind was addressing, uh, priority was addressing his concerns to these issues that he knew was in existence in, uh, or that the country uh, uh, would run itself into in the proclamation, if this bill was to be proclaimed. I recall at page 685, Mr. Vice President, the same Senator um, Al Rawi, who was then opposition senator, uh, page 685, he addressed the interoperability and effects of the data protection bill uh, with other pieces of legislation. He called again on that government and he stated, the concept of operationalization of this bill when it becomes an act is that the discourse on data protection implementation has to Factor the development of policies, and that is and 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 that is national policies as they relate to data protection and data management across the board. Because this act is in this act, in fact, has links to several other pieces of legislation. And again, I want to reiterate: this is not I'm not reading this into the record to waste the Senate's time. But I need this country and I need the Senate to understand that even in 2011, during the debate on this bill, these were the operational concerns that our government had. So therefore, in 2015, when Senator Al Rawi did take rain, and this government did take rain, these were concerns that were already prevalent in our minds. So by the time we took control in 2016, 2015, it was not that we were just sitting on our laurels. We knew that the bill, to proclaim it, there would have been serious challenges. And you know what? What supports that position, Mr. Vice President? I know I started off on a, on a high horse when I responded 
responded to, to, to Senator Lachmidial. But you know what, Senator, you know what, 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 Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, you know what reiterates that there were serious con problems in proclaiming this bill? The mere fact that in 2011, when the bill was passed by the then UNC, the then People's Partnership Government, that they could not proclaim any five years go of government that they did have. And maybe if during that debate, they had taken really some of the concerns that were raised by, gov by opposition, our, our government, who were then in the opposition at that time, as it relates to proclamation, maybe if it was done right then, we would not have been in the position that we are currently in now. And I need to remind the public about that. And Mr. Vice President, as I said, <coughs> Senator Al Rawi, the then opposition Senator Al Rawi, was not the only one. We had Senator Hines join that debate, and Senator, who was then uh, Minister Hines, who was then an opposition senator, raising other concerns as it related to proclamation. We then had, well, as I, I mentioned, um, Senator Gopi Schoon speaking about the lack of consultation on the bill when, when, when this bill was passed. And therefore, all of this is being said and read again into the record for the public to simply understand that us not proclaiming the Data Protection Act in its entirety is because from the get-go we, we, we inherited a piece of legislation that required a lot more work and require and, 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 and actually require we were we were five years later in the dance so you're looking at five years later technology has changed so that so therefore we had to adjust our minds to that we, so we had a bad piece of we had we had a piece of legislation that required work we were five years in the dance so we needed to bring our legislation up to speed and on top of that we had a piece of legislation in which we knew was passed without proper consultation and as a government that was one of those those were some of the places at which we had to start from taking control. So when we speak about this decade that this bill has been sitting on the books, remember it's from 2011 to 2023 we are talking about. And I, that is why I have, and I'm asking the question to the mover of the motion, account then for us for the five years that you all had control. The same way in which you all ask us questions, I'm asking the question to you. What did you do from 2011 to 2015? I can say to you what we have tried to do because we inherited a bad piece of law. We had to do consultation. We were five years in the dance. Now we are later than that in the dance, about seven years in the dance. So technology is constantly changing. We now have a GDPR model, international obligations, that we have to ensure that our legislation is in alignment with. And uh, again, we need to continue consultation. All of that being said, Mr. Vice President, is simply to say to Trinidad and Tobago, to say to the country, to say to, to, to this honorable Senate, I agree. I, I am so pleased that Senator Vieira, in his wise winding up of his presentation, recognized that while this is critical, it cannot be done immediately because we, it requires the government to take its time. It requires the legislators, the key stakeholders to take our time before we can put, before we can really and truly breathe life into the legislation. Mr. Vice President, um, as I, Mr. Vice President, can you tell me how much more time to full time? To end at 4.45. That is approximately, um, okay, th th thank you, Mr. Vice President. So, <clears throat> Mr. Vice President, um, of course, uh, those, uh, that, that, that would have been uh, one of the, the major concerns that we would have had. Now, I know concerns were also raised, uh, um, well, I'm, I'm not getting into the information, the, the, the information commissioner. And the reason for that is because that bit of legislation has already been proclaimed. Um, but what I do know, and if I may respectfully take uh, my colleagues uh, in, in your own uh, time, um, what you can rest assured, on, at least the country can rest assured, is that there is a budgetary allocation um, for that particular office. So, for example, Mr. Vice President, I know concerns were raised about the information commissioner. I just want to simply reiterate that the government recognizes the importance of this office, and so much so, um, so much so, what we have is for fiscal 2023, we have catered for the creation of the Office of the Information uh, Commissioner um, under the Office of the Prime Minister. And for my colleagues who may want to take some reading, who, who may want to read, it's under Head 13, uh, Subhead 16, Contract Employment, Item 007. 
have one, Office of the Information Commissioner. And what this shows, Mr. Vice President, is a revised estimates in the amount of $500,000 for this year. Um, it could be found, Mr. Vice President, for the purpose of the handset at page 63 of the recurrent expenditure fiscal 2021 to 2023. And it granted that the institutional arrangements are brought uh, to fruition uh, uh, within the next uh, coming months. Then we can move towards proclaiming the remaining sections of part two of the Data Protection Act. And the reason why I'm reading this uh, uh, into the record is to remind the public and remind the Senate that the government has already made the allocation. Yes, of course, there are the administrative issues as it relates to um, work, the, the, the contract part, uh, settling the contract for the, for, for the individual who will hold this particular position, the terms and the conditions, all of that. But at least the government, this is to reiterate that the government understands the importance of this office, so much so for fiscal 2023. And I've already identified the head and the subhead uh, in which we have already made the necessary allocation, um, budgetary allocation, that is, uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this particular office. Now, Mr. Vice President, uh, I know I would have also spoken. I know I would have also spoken about a consultation briefly. Um, if uh, I have to read into the record, Mr. Vice President, that of course public consultation uh, it brings several functional benefits uh, in the legislative process, legislating process. Um, consultation, as we all know, and this is we we all understand that it allows government to tap into the widest sources of information possible, which improves of course, the quality um, of the decision that we are able to reach. Mr. President, to make the consultation process effective, um, of course, checks are made um, as to whether the legal requirements have been met and the failure uh, to do so, whether um, wh what has to be d done, of course, to improve the failure in, in, in implementing certain legislation. Now, this is important, Mr. Vice President, in the creation of any legislation as it aids in covering all bases and ensuring that as a government, we are fostering more inclusive, democratic and transparent legislation. Now, again, and, and this is, and, and I'm going through this, I, I certainly don't like to waste this Senate's time and, and just go down a road of politicking. But again, Mr. Vice President, in, 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 in 2011, when this government inherited the bill, it was clear as daylight that the People's Partnership and the UNC had failed in consultation. Mr. President, in February 4, 2011, in the House debate, the PNM, while sitting in opposition, would have both caution and provided advice to the UNC-led government at the time. The opposition members would have raised various concerns in their contributions and their pleas, Mr. Vice President, unfortunately back then, would have fallen on deaf ears. I know I mentioned the Honorable Paula Gopi Schoon, uh, Minister Gopi Schoon, who was a then senator, um, a, a opposition senator. Um, in the Hansard paid 62 House debate on Friday, February um, 4th, 2011, the Honorable Senator said, we believe that the public really must be a part of these policy decisions because that is what, because what we are doing here, formulating policies that are affect, that affect privacy, data protection and protection of information, the public must be involved. Now, again, why do I raise this concern raised by Senator Gopi Schoon when this bill was debated? Because when we took control, we already knew that this bill was passed without proper consultation. So, in, uh, before, so before, we can, before we could fully operationalize the thing, before we could fully proclaim the thing, we understood that we had to go back to some extent to the drawing board and continue consultation or, or in most instances, begin con the consultation process. Um, again, Mr. Vice President, uh, um, and so, 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 what would have happened is uh, we too would have embarked upon, uh, we would have embarked upon uh, looking at uh, and, and having our public meetings, uh, not not public meetings, sorry, meeting with our necessary stakeholders upon taking control uh, in order to be able to determine what areas of the bill uh, we were required uh, to to revisit again. Now, Mr. President, I'm sure you would have heard of a of the phrase. Uh, 
Rome was not built in a day. Um, what the UNC did, unfortunately, in 2011 was that they created a piecemeal piece of legislation. And what we would have had to do, Mr. Vice President, is ensure that we go back to the key stakeholders. Uh, at this time, too, what we also had to bear in mind, or what we have to bear in mind before proclamation comes, Mr. Vice President, um, are, of course, uh, regional comparators. Mr. Mr. Vice President, the Data Protection Act is literally, as we know, everybody's business. It concerns both the private and public sector. Therefore, Mr. President, enacting the data protection legislation, unfortunately, is a tedious process that will take time. And all we are simply asking for, Mr. Vice President, is a little more time so that we can be able to ensure that our bill before this act, sorry, before it is fully proclaimed, that we are in alignment with our regional comparators, that we have met with all of our stakeholders, that we more or less do the damage control and uh, the damage control that was caused by the UNC in the haste in which this bill was passed in 2011. You know, Mr. Vice President, on October 24, 2016, I want to read into the record, there was a media release entitled Position on Proposed Amendments to the Data Protection Act by the, by the Ministry um by the Ministry of Public Administration. And uh, in 2016, Mr. Vice President, in that particular report, it showed that immediately after the PNM government coming into being, the Ministry of Public Administration recognizing that it was critical and it was necessary for that ministry to address its mind to data protection. Uh, Mr. Vice President, additionally, in 2018, for the public's benefit, the PNM government undertook a comprehensive comprehensive review of the data protection legislation in Trinidad and Tobago. The findings of the review confirmed that the Data Protection Act, as Mr. Bacchus would have said, certain parts had by that time become obsolete. Certain parts were not consistent with best practices, data protection best practices as defined in the European Union's general data protection regulations as the GDPR that we've been spoken, I'm sorry, that we spoke about all evening. Um, further, Mr. Vice President, in 2019, 19, again, this government, uh, through a collaboration with the Ministry of Communications, the Ministry of Public Administration, and the International Telecommunications Union, engage. And I have to read Minister, that into the record. Your time has come to an end. Oh. Opportunity.